Hello again and welcome to Public Speaking for Gannon University and this is chapter 12 with the Zarevsky and Ingalls textbook for achieving style through language. The gist of this chapter is as simple as what's on this slide. How you say something is often as important as what you say and I would venture to say often is an understatement. So our focus here is on style so that you can get better at how you say it since that's such a big deal. So we're talking about how to add interest and flair. Let's start by taking uh, an idea of style, taking the idea of style and talking about what that is. Zarevsky defines it as a pattern of choices attributed to a person. I think it's a fabulous picture here of the late, great Steve Jobs. He definitely had his own style, right? His pattern of choices was very clear, and that style came through in what he produced at Apple as well. The thing to remember about style is that the pattern of choices is recognized and interpreted by the audience. It's not something that's predetermined. I mean, we might begin to predict that Steve Jobs is gonna show up in sneakers, jeans, and a black mock turtleneck, but we are not um, necessarily going to know that it's predetermined, right? So style is kind of like credibility in that it's a lot about the perception of others. So a speaker's style, um, or any style really, is recognized and interpreted by the audience. And Zarevsky talks about three different types of style. He says that there is a generic style, and that's the kind of stuff that fits into a category. With generic style, you could say um, like genres of books, fiction and nonfiction. Okay. Then there's culture, identifying the basic styles of a culture, right? Some cultures are more loud, some cultures are more context-based, and you have to get a lot of meaning in a conversation from what's going on in the situation. Other cultures are less context-based, and a lot of the meaning comes straight from the words. And then there are archetypes, and that's patterns or basic human experiences that occur or recur across time and culture. And what Zarevsky means by, think about like the circle of life, right? The rhythm that we have from morning till night. So really, really broad ideas. So that's the gist of style. Let's talk about speech and speaker style. And on this screen, I have purposely broken the rule of six items, right? Because you can see such a variety of speaking style here, okay? So we've got the style of the speech, and I think you guys can identify that most easily by thinking about manuscript and the formality that that brings. That's one style, extemporaneous, and the informality that that brings. The style of a speech comes from a speaker's word choices, and it kind of directs the listeners to listen or take in the message in a particular way. Then there's the style of the speaker and language influences how audience perceive the speaker. So the fact that one speaker uses lots of like $10, $100 words with lots of syllables and words that people don't frequently hear, that influences how we perceive that speaker's style versus a speaker who speaks in everyday language. And that's a different style. Things like repetition of the word um, and finding the right pace and proportion. So the pacing and the emphasis on different words also has another style. I think uh, somebody who demonstrates a particular style with regard to pace and proportion is Barack Obama. He had a tremendous a tremendously unique style of rhythm with his public speaking. So that gives you a sense of, and you've seen enough speeches by now to know that everyone has their own style. It comes both in the words themselves 
but also in the delivery. And style is determined by the audience. The speaker can try to influence how it's determined or how it's perceived, but really it's determined by the audience. While we're talking about style in general, let's just be specific about looking at the differences between oral and written style. And Zarefsky and Ingalls do a great job of putting this into four categories. And the first category is potential for clutter. In the oral language style, we can use fewer words to get the message across. In the written language style, we have more words to get the message across. Things have to be more formal. Same thing with sentence length. In the oral language style, we can use shorter sentences. And in written, we have longer words. So one of the things that we run into when we're speaking um, is that we have the potential for speaking the way we would talk and making clutter. And the oral style really demands that shortness in terms of fewer words and shorter sentences. So that's one of the differences. Another difference is what we call simplicity or what they call simplicity. And this comes in the form of fewer syllables in the oral style and more syllables in the written style. You can also see that in sentence length. And so simplicity is another characteristic that helps differentiate the oral versus the written style. The third characteristic is formality. In the written style, we have fewer contractions and we're more likely to say cannot and do not instead of can't and don't. We also use more colloquialisms, which are phrases that are commonly understood but might be too informal to put into the written word. So you don't see those as many. So the characteristic of informality shows up in contractions and the amount of colloquialisms that are used in the speech. And the fourth way you can differentiate oral and written speech is in something called reflexivity. When we're speaking, we do a lot more self-reference. I, me, we. When we're writing, we don't do nearly as much self-reference. You just don't see a lot of things written with, uh, or in first person with self-reference and self-deprecation in a written form. Now, in today's world where we use Twitter and such truncated speech in some of our social media and electronic exchanges, you might see more of it. But if you were looking at a full article or a formal letter, you certainly wouldn't see that kind of reflexivity. So those are four ways that the oral and the written speech differs. So if these are the ways that oral and written speech differs and we know what style is and we've kind of established that, especially really good speakers that we get to see for various reasons, including politics or entertainment or causes, or even if you go back to jobs, commercialism, they all have a style, right? So how do we achieve that style? That's really what the focus of our unit today is about. We're going to look at achieving that style through clarity, rhythm, and vividness. And I've shared uh, a great cartoon about, that really demonstrates what kind of style someone has um, through the cartoon. All right, so let's look at clarity first. The first way that you can achieve clarity is through what we call concrete words. Concrete words are words where the speaker has specific images referenced in the words so that the audience can picture more specifically what the speaker is discussing. So here is an abstract reference. You might say the road was rough. People could picture just about anything when you say the road was rough. But imagine that you said the road was pitted with muddy craters and basketball-sized boulders. Wow. Now you begin to picture just how big those rocks were, right? And you begin to picture what the holes in the road looks like. And you might come up with something more like this. And that changes everything about what the audience can picture. So one way you achieve clarity is by using concrete words. 
Another way to achieve clarity is by using maxims. And maxims are concise statements that convey a principle to the audience. It's sort of the distillation of a principle boiled down into just a few words, and you know these. Here are a couple. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. Better to be safe than sorry. And even buy low, sell high, if you're paying attention to the economy. So using concrete words and using maxims are both ways that you can help increase the clarity in your speech. Jargon and technical terms are something you actually want to avoid unless you are 100% sure that your audience is familiar with that. So let's take a look at what we mean by that. What if I said to you, what's your value proposition? Value proposition is an organization's capacity to say, this is what we do better. Uber's value proposition is this. Uber's, uh, excuse me, offering Uber convenience. So they built on a slang word that had been picked up and become very popular. And they said, we offer more convenience than any of the other transportation choices you could make. So without explicitly saying so, Uber expertly highlights everything that stinks about taking a traditional taxi and points out everything that's better. Value proposition is not language everyone knows though. So you need to keep that in mind. You can't use that. You know, Slack has one too, but that doesn't mean everyone knows what a value proposition is. Here's another way it shows up. What if I said to you, well, you know, people who experience this often have TIAs and they go on to struggle with their recovery. What's a TIA? A lot of people don't know. But a TIA is a transient ischemic attack, which is a form of a stroke, but it just lasts for a few minutes and it often does not have the same effect as a full stroke. But if you didn't know what a TIA was, wouldn't that be isolating? And that's the effect of using jargon and technical terms when your audience is unfamiliar with it. It's really frustrating to them. It really isolates them and it does not bring the audience with you the way you're supposed to. So we can use concrete words, we can use maxims, we should avoid jargon and technical terms. What else can we do? We can apply what we call word economy or economy of words. And I'm going to give you two examples. And the first one has no economy of words. Here we go. Sitting Bull was one of the most important and significant of all Native American leaders. He was born in the year 1831 near Grand River in an area that is now part of the state of South Dakota. A fearless and courageous warrior, he ended up being elected chief of the Hunkapapa Sioux in 1867. In the following years, he also attracted a large and numerous following among the tribes of the Cheyenne and Arapaho. Now just look at how much space that takes up. And you were bored probably by the second sentence. So let's take a look at it when you've used economy of words. Sitting Bull was one of the most important Native American leaders. He was born 1831 near Grand River in South Dakota. A fearless warrior, he was elected chief of the Hunk Papa Sioux in 1867. In the following years, he also attracted a large following among the Cheyenne and Arapaho. So many fewer words. Here's this one. You've got at least two and a half lines more and lots more syllables. So figuring out the best word usually means you've eliminated a lot of other words. Take a look at the second sentence. He was born 1831 near Grand River in South Dakota versus he was born in the year of 1831 near Grand River in an area that is now part of the state of South Dakota. So we essentially, in the second version, eliminated from in to of, or maybe to the end of state. Because I think it says, no, it says near South Dakota is what it says in the new version. Think about how many fewer words that is. That not only means that you don't have to work as hard to keep your audience's attention, 
but it also means that your words pack a more powerful punch and that's huge. So word economy. The next way you can achieve clarity is what we call active voice. And you might remember this from English class, nobody run away. In the active voice, you think about or you are expressing who did what. And using the active voice highlights the doer of the action, the person who did it. Passive voice highlights what was done, therefore focusing on the action and the sense that the action is done to the subject. So you stole the cookie from the cookie jar versus the cookie was stolen from the cookie jar. So the action was done to the jar versus a person did it. The effect of this is that you get um, a stronger, snappier, more direct approach. And it therefore keeps your audience more focused. Because imagine if McDonald's said, it's being loved by me instead of I'm loving it. Passive language is vague, focuses on the receiver. We want to use the active voice. It makes all the difference in keeping your audience's attention and it really contributes to your style of directness. All right, so let's recap what we've done with thinking about how we can use clarity to establish our style and improve our style. We can use concrete words that reference very specific things, helping the audience to conjure the images we want them to conjure. We can use maxims that distill a principle down to a few words. We want to avoid jargon or use it only when you know 100% of your audience can follow you. Because if 100% of your audience can follow you, then it allows you to be succinct. Word economy, that means you inf using fewer words than you originally think through. And then making sure you use the active voice so you focus on the doer, not on the action being done to the object. So the first way we can be or have greater, better style is clarity, which is not what I just did. Um, the second way we can achieve style is through rhythm. And we're going to look at a few ways that you can achieve it through rhythm as well. In fact, we'll see three ways. And the first one is to repeat. And by repeating, we don't mean exactly the same thing all the time, but instead reiteration of the word or a set of words in successive clauses or sentences. Reiteration of the word or set of words in successive clauses or sentences. So here's an example I took from George Bush's first speech to Congress after the 9-11 attack. Great harm has been done to us. We have suffered great loss. And in our grief and anger, we have found our mission and our moment. Freedom and fear are at war. The advance of human freedom the great achievement of our time and the great hope of every time now depends on us. Our nation, this generation, will lift a dark thread of violence from our people and our future. We will rally the world to this cause by our efforts, by our courage. We will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. Another way to introduce rhythm is to use parallel wording, which means a similar arrangement of a pair or series of related words. Not repeating, but a similar arrangement of related words. It could also be related phrases or sentences. One example is from a famous suffragist named Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and it goes like this. Rich and poor, intelligent and ignorant, wise and foolish, virtuous and vicious, man and woman. It is ever the same. Each soul must depend wholly on itself. So the parallel wording comes from intelligent and ignorant, wise and foolish, virtuous and vicious. You can hear the rhythm as it goes. Here is a video example from a 1984 Democratic National Convention speech by the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Throughout 
this campaign, I've tried to offer leadership to the Democratic Party and the nation. If in my high moments I have done some good, offered some service, shed some light, healed some wounds, rekindled some hope, or stirred some wrong from apathy and indifference, or in any way along the way helped somebody, then this campaign has not been in vain. So in Reverend Jackson's speech, the parallelism comes from verb modifier noun, verb modifier noun, done some good, offered some service, shed some light. So we get two great examples from two great speakers of parallelism there. Let's take a look at the third way we can accomplish rhythm, which is called antithesis, which is actually one of my favorite words to say. Um, and that's when we pair opposites within a speech. And you can hear that in the very famous phrase from JFK's inaugural speech, ask not what you can do for your country, but what your country can do for you. And of course, another one is the famous speech from the landing on the moon. And that's the one we'll see here taken from the YouTube channel. The surface appears to be uh, very, very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder down there. Uh, it's very fine. And now step off the lamina. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful as well. So two great examples of antithesis as well. Recapping how we can use rhythm to establish our style. We have three primary tools in our toolbox, and that is repetition, parallel wording, and antithesis. That takes us to the third category of ways we can improve our style or establish our style. We had clarity, we have rhythm, and the third one is vividness. And with vividness, we also have a few different ways you can accomplish that. And the first two are really straightforward. We've talked about them throughout the semester. One is giving descriptive details that suggest a mental picture. You can accomplish this vividness mostly through concreteness, but really adding a lot of modifiers. You can always add stories, which is, uh, you know, uh, information that's got a plot, an introduction, uh, some kind of, you know, sort of peak or climax in the story and a denouement and even an ending. Um, and this helps the audience identify through some kind of personalized narrative. It doesn't have to be yours. It could be someone else's, but it's a story with a beginning, a middle and an ending. So those are two ways you can achieve vividness. A third way is through a simile. And a simile is an explicit statement that one thing is like another. Air pollution is eating away at the monuments in Washington, DC, like a giant Alka-Seltzer tablet. That's one I got from another public speaking text by Stephen Lucas. Using the word like distinguishes a simile from another kind of comparison. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but let's get this second example of a simile from the Shawshank Redemption. I've had some long nights in stir. Alone in the dark with nothing but your thoughts, time can draw out like a blade. Time can draw out like a blade. Great writing in that movie. If you've never seen it, I strongly encourage it. It is definitely adult level, though. A third tool for vividness is metaphors. And this is when you name something in terms of another, but it is definitely another way of establishing a comparison. One of the most famous examples of metaphors, and it's actually more of a series of metaphors, comes from... Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech at the National Monument. Let's listen to this example of a comparison where you're not using like or as. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discourse of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, 
So there are actually two metaphors here. One is from the words jangling discords, which he uses to refer to the racial problems. And then he also says beautiful symphony of brotherhood, which is a way to refer to solving racial problems through faith. So in a very short clip, we get two very powerful comparisons and talking about how one thing is another, almost looking through a lens and seeing solving this problem through the lens of faith instead of solving it through the courts or through violence. Those are metaphors. A tool called alliteration is up next, and that's when you repeat the introductory sound. And there is really no better example than this one from the movie Dragnet, starring Dan Aykroyd. Just like every other foaming rabbit psycho in the city with a foolproof plan, you've forgotten you're facing the single finest fighting force ever assembled. I don't know how many F sounds he gets in there, but he really knocks it out. He just gets the alliteration so powerful there. Onomatopoeia is a fantastic word to say, much like antithesis or juxtaposition, which we also use in public speaking. But onomatopoeia is the use of sounds that resemble what they describe. Roar, wow, pow, bam, tick tock, tick tock. These are all sounds that resemble the meaning they are trying to convey. Now, Yes, this can be way overdone. So remember that if you're going to use it, use it sparingly and with great strategic purpose so you can increase the vividness. That's what we're focusing on right now. So far, we have descriptions, stories, a simile, a metaphor. We have alliteration, onomatopoeia. Those all increase vividness. An additional tool is personification. And this is when the speaker references ideas or concepts in human terms. So something that's really abstract, like a table or a teapot or a lamp becomes animated. It takes on human qualities. You probably covered this in English class as well. Let's look at this terrific example, courtesy of Carr's movie. Question, where is McQueen? Oh, what's your name? You, you don't know my name? No. No, oh, I know your name. We're going to talk later, Mater. <laughs> later, Mater. That's funny. Ah! Oh, all right. I want to know who's responsible for wrecking my town. Sure. I want his hood on a platter. She's got to be from my attorney's office. Hey, thanks for coming, but we're all set. He's letting me go. He's letting you go? Ah, you look great this morning. Did you do something different with your side view mirrors? What do you want, Sally? What do you have at your store? Dials. And if no one can get to you? I won't sell any tires. So what do you want them to do? Fix the road! Because we are a town worth fixing. Yeah! The fabulous thing of this movie and part of the reason it's a huge success is that different kinds of cars represent different kinds of personalities. But if we only have our voice and our ourselves as public speakers, then we can accomplish the same thing by what words we choose. Eleanor Roosevelt gave one that's much more formal in this Example, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You're able to say to yourself, I have lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. And here she uses fear. She makes fear human. Look it in the face. Whatever you picture fear as, look it dead in the face and go after it. So she animates or personifies fear. You can also refer to hypothetical people, which is a fabulous way to do this. It sounds a little awkward, uh, but in this example, Denzel Washington does a great job of it at the beginning of his address to a football team that's having racial discord. And it, the reason this can be powerful is that it involves the audience. It can occur in the form of rhetor rhetorical questions, or it can occur in the form of recapping a public, a, excuse me, recapping a dialogue that you were involved in, or maybe two other people were involved in, but you reference them as if they're standing right next to you. In this example, we get the rhetorical question. This is a bit of an uplifting speech here.
anybody know what this place is? This is Gettysburg. This is where they fought the Battle of Gettysburg. 50,000 men died right here on this field. Fighting the same fight. And we're still fighting amongst ourselves today. This green field right here, painted red, bubbling with blood of young boys, smoke, and hot lead pouring right through their bodies. Listen to their souls, man. They killed my brother with malice in my heart. Hatred destroyed my family. You listen. When you take a lesson from the dead. If we don't come together right now on this hollow ground, we too will be destroyed. Just like that. I don't care if you like each other or not, but you will respect each other. And maybe. I don't know, maybe you will learn to play this game like men. Great speech by Denzel Washington in the movie Remember the Titans. It's a fabulous underdog sports story, obviously about teamwork as well. So that's another way, that rhetorical question there is another way you can uh, create vividness. So let's recap eight tools to create vividness. You can describe, you can use a story, you can use comparisons in the form of similes or metaphors. You can use alliteration, onomatopoeia, personification, and then hypothetical references to people, meaning you can either use a rhetorical question or recap a dialogue or a conversation that happened as any recap it as if people are standing right there. So, Clarity, that's one of our tools, clarity, rhythm, and vividness. Those are the ways that we identify people's styles, and those are also the ways that we can create our own style. An element we need to quickly touch on is about gender language, and I'm leaving this up to you. You need to look this up in your textbook, but also you can use these two websites I've given you. It's important to make sure that we use gender neutral language so that we can make sure we are politically correct, but keenly it's about avoiding offensive language, uh, especially when you didn't mean to. The last major piece we're gonna cover is that everybody needs to eventually establish their own speaking style. And here are some ways to think about incorporating that or developing that for yourself. One is when you review your speech, think about style. Just say to yourself, "What is there any style in here at all? Is there anything that makes it stand out? Practice scripting. If you will begin to see flow in your speech, if you write your speech out exactly the way you'd like to say it, even if you're not allowed to use it or it's not a manuscript speech, if you write it out that way, you begin to create flow between the items, between the main ideas, and it gives you a chance to go back and look at it before you deliver it and see if there is any style which leads us to that critical lens. Of course, you can use that on yourself, but you can also use that when you are watching other speeches, whether it's your peers or public speeches that you have an opportunity to see. Start thinking, is this a good speech? What makes a good speech? Is this something I would wanna see again? Is this something I'm gonna remember because there was alliteration or there was personification? What made it good if it was good? Another way you begin to establish your own speaking style is through practicing over and over again, which of course is the last thing you wanna hear, but it's true. Remember that meaning lies with the audience. Meaning is in the mind of the audience. And we should be asking ourselves, is what I'm saying going to ring true with my audience or does it just ring true with me? What do I need to say to make sure that the meaning that's in their mind is the one I'm trying to convey? Make a strategic purpose is our second to last method for doing this of saying, 
I want to establish something that really stands out and I want to do it at the place in my speech where I have the strongest message. What should I do? Should I use personification? Should I use alliteration? Should I add more concrete words because I want to make an image stand out for them? But do something on purpose with your style. And the last thing is watch as many speeches as you can. You can go to American Reddit rhetoric.org americanrhetoric.org and see the greatest 100 american speeches and the greatest speeches of all time many of them have video even more have audio and some of them are so old that you have only script either way you have an opportunity to see and hear what works and it doesn't matter if you watch the short speeches or the long speeches just watching more of them can help you get where you want to go and here we are. We started out this unit by talking about style, what style is, and the difference between oral and written style. Then we discussed all the tools you now have in your toolbox to establish style through clarity, rhythm, and vividness. And then we talked just for a moment about ways that you can intentionally cultivate your own style in public speaking. Once again, it's been great, and I thank you for your time. Oh.